ready and not quite, not quite. <laughs> All right. I think we are live. Just go to our page here and check to make sure everything went all right. We are live. Thank you guys for tuning in. Let's see, who do we have on today? Let us know, uh, drop your name, comments, where you're tuning in from in the, in the comment section below. Let's get a roll call going, make sure all of our audio and sound works. So if you guys can't hear us, let us know. We're working on what feels like rural broadband here in the nation's capital, but um, I think it's just too many folks trying to use the internet. Uh, we're still on our stay at home orders, um, except for a few different businesses. So uh, I think folks are tuning into Netflix tonight. Name, comments, where you're tuning in from. Yep, there we go. All right. Looking good. Well, we've got Denny from Denny, you're from all over the place, says hello. Mary Grainer's on. Jimmy Reeves from Tennessee. Maggie Nutter, thanks for tuning in. Dan Gaskell from Montana, looks great, looks great. Britton Ellis, Western Kansas, sounds good. Thank you, Britton. Kevin Escobar, hello from Florida. And Maggie says, you sound good and the picture's good. So we've got more folks tuning in here. Couple more jumping on. Thank you for tuning in, spending another Friday with us during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so we've got two very special guests here tonight. Thirsty guests, Patrick and Amy Robinette from North Carolina. Finally, I have somebody in the same time zone as me. It's yes. a lot of um, <laughs> mountain time zone guests that I've had the past couple months or the past couple of weeks. And so for them, it's six o'clock. For us, it's nighttime. So yeah, we're enjoying beverages. We're, you know, winding down from, from another wild week. Uh, but North Carolina, micro summit processors, and you're also ranchers too. That's correct. Yes, we own uh, Harris Robinette Beef. Um, and so we uh, have a, a vertically integrated operation. Um, my name's Patrick and this is Amy. And uh, so we started uh, our operation here in North Carolina 20 years ago. Um, and we started as a cow-calf operation. Uh, that was the plan, was that we're going to breed cows, raise calves, and go hunt and fish the rest of our day. And so then it just progressed along very rapidly. Um, and so seven years ago, we opened up a USDA uh, slaughter processing and further processing operation. And so now we've connected all the pieces together. And, uh, and so we created our total operation. So we're in control of everything from beginning all the way to the end. Wow. Yeah, and we'll get into it in a little bit uh, down the line here, what those different levels mean, because we've got folks tuning in here that don't quite know much about the, you know, independent meat processing sector. And so we want to start from the basics and kind of build our way up into what you guys do and, and what the road ahead looks like. You know, we've got um, grocery store beef kind of maybe looking a little in short supply lately. Mm -hmm. And so consumers have started turning to some of these other alternatives and, um, you know, what, what, what happens next? What happens once all of this coronavirus pandemic uh, wears off and, um, you know, we are left with uh, a different looking industry maybe, hopefully, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and that leads into, you, know, you touched on a lot of different things, but that was our belief from 20 years ago is that uh, we farm and so let's provide the, 
or the food that we produce to a community and whatever that community might be. So we actually are, we self-distribute nationwide. Um, but that was the choices that we, we made. We don't, you know, we have people that come to our facility that have 20, 30 cows. We have other people that come to our facility that have hundreds of cows. And so we, you know, with inside of our facility, we're taking care of multiple from farmers markets to restaurants to retail, um, different, totally different levels. And then there's our thing that we are in uh, all the direct consumer sector, the retail sector, and then also the food service sector. Yeah, so folks, these are the experts that we're talking to tonight. We brought you some of the best from North Carolina here. So I hope that you came here with some questions. Um, I know you haven't been shy about those questions in past uh, Facts Only Friday live streams. Um, we're here to answer them. This is, this is the opportunity. We're talking independent beef processing. We're breaking out from the big four. And when we talk big four, we're saying, you know, JBS, Tyson's, Cargill, National, uh, what that looks like outside of that space. And, and um, there's been a lot of heat on those companies, both in Congress and in the public eye lately. Um, you know, many senators have called for a Department of Justice investigation into price fixing allegations and other anti-competitive practices. Um, they're feeling the heat with some of the solutions that we're bringing forward from the U.S. Cattlemen's Association to try to force them into the cash negotiated marketplace a little bit more. Um, so, so, you know, we've got to start increasing competition from, from you know, different levels and up. And um, so I personally am very excited to have you both on here today to learn a little bit more. Why don't we start then... Um, We'll start at the bottom. You want to give us a little bit of an overview of kind of um, the different levels of inspection and how you fall into that, those categories. Yeah. So, yeah, so there is, there's, there's three different main types of inspection. There's a custom exempt, there's a state inspection, and then there's a federal inspection. So custom exempt means that you have an animal, you want to sell that, you know, somebody wants to buy that animal, that whole animal or the half of the animal uh and then they want or uh let's say that uh you just want to have it for just personal consumption that is a custom exempt facility um and there's no inspection uh they have to keep records in case something does happen but there's no oversight into no major oversight into what they do so that's that's one uh uh group the, th the next group is state inspected. Um, and so they have to follow state guidelines, you know, the guidelines that their, their state um, presents. The animals come in, they're harvested, they're processed, and then, but they have to stay within the state. Um, so like for us, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture has state inspectors that will go in the facility there's record keeping, there's testing, all in the state labs, so everything stays internal, but then the meat stays within the state, and then at that time, that way, then their compliance officers can then react if there's a food safety issue or recall issue, it's, it's contained. And then there's the federal side, and then the federal side, all it does is, it's like the state, except that I have federal inspectors and then those federal inspectors uh, keep up with the records from a much broader standpoint. And then, uh, mm -hmm. and then we can distribute the meat anywhere in the country. Um, now, there's some funniness in all of this because due to the Supreme Court rulings on internet sales, I don't necessarily have to have a federal plant to sell to you in DC because the breakdown of, of the ruling is if you're on the computer and you Google me and then you buy from me and I ship directly to you, it was like you were here in North Carolina actually making the purchase. Wow. And so we're getting into some weirdness now with the use of technology and then what is actually needed. But there's a lot of arguments about the state inspected, federal inspected, 
crossing state lines, not crossing. And quite honestly, 30 years ago, yes, every state was, there was a significant difference between the states and their beliefs. But we've whittled all of that due to, you know, previous recalls, food safety concerns, things like that. Everybody's pretty much on the same guidelines now. Um, there might be minor changes. Um, it's like out west, we can, there's different aspects of Buffalo and Catalo, but in North Carolina, we can count that as exotic and it's hardcore that it's exotic. So there are some minor changes and differences between the states, but majority of the time, there's really no difference between a state inspected and a federal inspected facility. I think food safety has kind of made all of this um, a little bit more of an equal playing field um, in terms of what they, their goal is. Now, um, it's taking the state inspections and obviously the custom exam. Um, but all it takes is, you know, we follow the food recalls, we've seen what's happened. And so, um, you know, honestly, for us being USDA meat processors, food science and food safety is, is probably at the core of what we do, making sure that the products that leave our facility are completely safe for human consumption. Oh. So what sorts of things are you both doing to make sure that uh, your plant continues to stay up to speed, up to date, however you want to do it? Is there any um, like personal education requirements or anything that you take on personally to, you know, stay up to date on the best available science? We read a lot. <laughs> um, we, you know, we're, we, something will happen at another facility and just reading about it and then saying, okay, you know, the, the problem with this business is we are human controlled yeah. and humans aren't perfect. And so there's always going to be a, some sort of a mistake. What you're trying to do is mitigate that risk of how hard that mistake's going to be. And so um, the fun part about it is, is that we've taken the regulations and when you read the regulations, it, it the, the government doesn't say thou shall not. It just says, you know, we really don't encourage it, but we can't stop you if you got scientific documentation that says otherwise. And so in a lot of cases, we look at the regulations and then we build our own system. So when we open up the plant, number one thing, not a single employee that we had came from another facility. And the reason why was I didn't want to hear, well, at such and such, this is the way we did things. Well, we're not at such and such. I don't want to deal with that. And so we actually started with a staff with zero experience with the rules, with the regulations and said, here's how, here's how we see this is going to look. And we've made the changes. Uh, Amy has a, uh, a, a joke in that she, she, if she wants me to knock out the outer wall and make it like a, the glass wall of the car wash where you sit there and watch your car get washed so that you can sit there and watch the whole process at any point in time um, because we do do things so differently in our facility. And, and quite honestly, we're, we're kind of proud of that. And mm -hmm. I know that's, that sounds kind of vain, um, but I I'm, I'm, I'm have an education background and, and so does Patrick. And so, I mean, kind of watching through, what, going through the whole process of everything, um, I mean, we're proud of what our employees do. Mm -hmm. We're proud of, of kind of the steps that we've taken. And we network with other people across the country trying to learn and constantly trying to improve and have that dialogue of, okay, you know, how, how can we get better? Um, but, but quite honestly, we bring, I, I, I don't have like a record number, but in North Carolina, it is pretty common for an FFA chapter or an AP science class to come and ask to tour our facility. Mm -hmm. And we take our students on our kill floor and, and we show them, you know, everything from start to finish, just because, again, it's, it's the science behind what we're doing. And I'll even add in there too, animal animal rights groups. Um, no. Yes. So, fun story. Um, I like going into 
places and listen to difference of opinion. And I knew that there was somebody that was with HSUS that was going to give a talk about the horrors of animal slaughter. And I went <laughs> afterwards, I invited her to come visit and, uh, and she came and we sat there and dropped animals right in front of her and it freaked her out to begin with because we didn't give her time to prepare. But then she stayed the whole day and then brought somebody else from HSUS in and then they stayed for a whole nother day. And then I said, I told them that, you know, you, if you're so against what we're doing, and then they agreed they're not against what we're doing, what the other people are doing. Well, then that's fine. Then promote us. And we got HSUS to then promote Harris Robinette beef and microsoma processors. Wow. So, you know, the problem with ag culture is, is that we don't educate. We're so busy on the farm that we just don't have time. Just shut up and eat the food that we produce. But in an information age, we're just striving for somebody to educate us. And so we just open up doors. Come on in. We ain't got nothing to hide. And, um, and that's, that's been the stance that we've taken the whole time from beginning to end. Come to the farm. See what we're doing. Come to the facility. Come see what we're doing. Um, it's bold. She drug tests me all the time. But, I mean... <laughs> We, we, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of, I'm tired of somebody else speaking for me. You're not speaking for me because they don't know our operation. They don't know what we're doing. So let me speak for myself. I think that sentiment is very much shared with the other folks on this uh, conference here tonight that, you know, let me speak for myself. Um, Mary says, we don't have any voice. I hope we've got that fixed. Anyone else having audio issues, let us know. Um, but we'll, we'll keep going here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, let, let us speak for ourselves and you know, let us do our own thing. I think that's why folks are kind of drawn to this organization and um, you know, this association. Now, we just got started on something this week, last week. It's been a wild week already. I don't know if it was this week or last week, but uh, this independent beef processors task force that we've um, trying to get off the ground here. And this is a call for folks who are tuning in. If you wanna get involved in this issue, let us know. We're looking for folks to develop this task force. We are hoping to just reimagine the meat processing system. And maybe that's a little bit too bold. We'll start with some easy wins first, but... <laughs> um, I would like to hear some more uh, about your vision for that task force and, and how you'd like to see, um, you know, U.S. cattlemen's make change in this space. Yes. So we called it the Independent Meat Processors Group uh, Committee. And the reason why was, you know, we are a small process when you compare us to JBS. I mean, make no bones about it. I mean, they, we are. We can slaughter a hundred head a day. So, I mean, it is small, but it also it's, there's, there's grandness to this. So we don't like the word small because it, it's a belittling. We don't like the word niche. Um, the, the word niche is supposed to mean special, but people in the industry also uses niche as small. You're not significant. Independent is a more perfect wording because it brings us back to what cattlemen are. Cattlemen are independent and it allows for us to not be price takers, but price makers. And if we can get the processors together and the, and the problem is that over the last 40, 30 to 40 years, the process, the, the animals rolling through the independent processors has been eroding. Um, Micro Summit wouldn't be alive without uh, without Harris Robinette being the anchor producer. Every mm -hmm. week, animals are coming in. Every week, without fail, they have some work to do. If you go to your local local butcher shop right now or local meat shop, they never knew when somebody was going to come in or not. And then they got to maintain labor, and it just it's too costly. So let's from the U.S. cattlemen side, let's come together. Let's promote the small producers, 
or the not small producers, but this, the independent processors, small processors, and let's work out a new way of marketing our cattle. And that's something that I've been saying here this last seven, couple months. When the cattlemen are, you know, talking about how they're shut out from JBS and Tyson, blah, blah, blah. You know, our prices are gone. Look, stop marketing cattle. Let's start marketing beef. If you take it from that and switch it to that dialogue, and we're not going to market the heifer out there, but we're going to market the beef that heifer is going to produce. We're changing the conversation real fast. And with that said, we're going to have to change how we do, how, how we empty out the, the feedlots. It isn't going to be whole pins, tractor trailers running off at one time. However, if we would stop and really think about this, it's actually beneficial to the feedlot to, to, to not do that. Because how do I know what's going to happen six months from now? I'm taking a guess. I'm taking a gamble. But what if I if I uh, get my pen set up so I'm um, every month I'm pulling animals out? Now we're spreading out our price risk over a whole year where things might be bad this time, but then it's really good over here. And so it, it's an actual advantage to the cattlemen if we stop and we can and look at a new system. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things that drives me insane is, is, and I hear all the time in North Carolina, this ain't the way we do things in North Carolina, son. Well, guess what? <laughs> you know, we can go and bring all this advancement, all this technology. I can GPS chip my cows. I can sit here and see where every cow is, but I'm going to market my cattle the same way we've done it for the last hundred years. We're falling short with all the changes. Yeah. So the idea is with th this committee is to start piecing together identifying what our capacities are across the country, where are they located, what are their capabilities, what are their needs, and then also then move over to the cattlemen and say, hey, we can create some united strategy that we are finally going to be the price takers or the price makers, not the price takers. It's a revolution, folks. Jump on board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make another plea for questions here. We've got another little little segment, little bit, and then we're going to dive into, into your questions. So um, make sure to drop them in the comment space below there. And I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, I've got a, a guest, an extra guest here tonight. <laughs> My little Australian shepherd's trying to jump in the take. Um, what we want to talk about now is kind of what U.S. Cattlemen's Association, some of the work that's already happened on Capitol Hill, some of the legislation already out there. Um, you know, some of these are super hot questions that you guys have been peppering us for weeks on. Um, so let's just dive in. We've got a couple bills out there already in Congress. One of them deals with the custom exempt plants and the other deals with uh, mostly the interstate uh, travel of, of beef and meat. And so um, let's talk about the custom exempt one first, the Prime Act uh, introduced by Thomas Massey in the House and uh, Angus King in the Senate. So um, what does the Prime Act do? What are your thoughts on it? What, what's the future on that bill? Um, scares me to death. The Prime Act really worries me. And the, and the reason why it worries me is, is that it offers up way too much opportunity for somebody to mess it up for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, what I mean by that. So in our facility, day one that we opened up, our supervisor inspector, he always said, You're, the beef is the most regulated due to Jack in the Box. We all know about what happened with Jack in the Box. Years and years and years ago, but guess what we're still talking about? We've done a lot of work in this in the meat in the meat processing industry from the smaller producers, uh, the, the smaller processors have done a tremendous amount of work on food safety. The Prime Act just opens up way too much, too many doors, in my opinion, for anybody just to slaughter the cows, process in the barn, and then distribute. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it, it, there's too much 
potential failure. Um, if we didn't carry it that far, it, there's good elements to the bill um, where it does promote a more local um, food system that that we could get behind, but there's too much he it got carried too far in my opinion. Yeah. And, I, and I really think it's hard for the average consumer or quite honestly, even the average cattle producer to understand just how much testing like is required in a USDA facility. Um, and, and again, now we're at, at a disadvantage in a lot of ways from the big, bigger plants because they have labs in their you know, on site, they do E. coli testing, all that, you know, on site, they can get the answers back quickly, um, you know, and all of those things. But, um, you know, again, like just the toxins and, and all of those, what we call in, in the cousins that hang around that you're constantly testing for, because, you know, um, as one of our old inspectors used to say, if the cousins are in town, you know, the, 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 the bad boy is coming and so you got to be real, real careful about all of that. And so because we understand that, it just, we know that our custom facilities that we see are just not equipped to handle that. Um, they're, they're not equipped to, to, to kind of get behind that, the cost that is associated with that. Um, it, it's just really, really difficult. And you know, again, you know, we watch all of this stuff, you know, what we just had lettuce recalled and, you know, saw what all of that looks like and, and the sicknesses and all of that. And, and that I think is our, our concern just from a, a food safety issue. A custom plant, a custom plant, you stop and think about it this way. A, a family of four will consume one finished deer a year. That's in their normal beef consumption. So in a custom plant, or a custom location, if I kill one animal, I'm only infecting four people. What they're trying to do is take, kill one animal and then let's put it into the grocery store or put it into the restaurant. You're exposed, the, the, the rate of exposure is too tremendous. Now, do we have to have everybody to be federal facilities? Absolutely not. You have that state plant as an option. And that's where, you know, like that's what I'm saying, like the Thomas Massey bill, the Prime Act, just it carries it way too far. We should have started with just the state plants. We have tremendous amount of number of state facilities all across the country that can pick up a lot of slack. And then we can keep it within the states. Our facility can only feed 0.9% of the total North Carolina population based upon 54 pounds of beef consumption a day per person or per year per person. Like I, you know, but I, but we have all these state plants across the state that can then come in and fill it, you know. So we, let, custom folks, there's a need for them. We're not, we're not discrediting them. In fact, we're trying to figure out how we can work because we have several custom slaughter folks that come to our facility that I'm burning up an eight hour um, inspection period on that there's really no need for. And so there is a utilization for them, but from a from a mainstream get out marketplace, uh, that, that that that's worrisome. And quite honestly, and, and again, the, this committee that that's kind of been formed, even if I mean, obviously, you know, our concerns about the Prime Act are not the Act itself; it's just the safety side. But if the Prime Act passes and it's partnered with this committee, and I mean people like us that are USDA inspected, that, that can kind of, for lack of a better term, mentor and, and, and help those other people kind of get through this together. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, when we first opened, when I first opened Micro Summit and the inspectors just drilled me with all of those questions, you know, and you're just not prepared for all of that. And you got to take a breath and, and you got to just kind of go back and, and get your facts together. And so hopefully we can have the conversation with the Prime Act and the, the committee at in the same time so that, you know, no matter what happens, the U.S. cattlemen are in a better position and our processors are better educated um, 
to kind of handle this next generation of agriculture that's coming post COVID? Absolutely. First and foremost, we're building capacity. We're increasing competition. Absolutely. The Prime Act, while well intentioned, of course, there's some changes that are going to be needed to make it more palatable on a broader scale. Um, the new markets for state inspected meat and poultry act this is the bill introduced by senator mike rounds in the senate um would allow these state inspected facilities to sell across state lines how do we feel about this bill it's fine i, I mean it's fine you when we're you know we it's time uh we have the uh there there was an interstate market bill that was out there that that died and, it, and a lot of it is the politics from the big boys you know we ought to remember, for every pound of beef somebody eats of mine today for dinner, they're not eating Cargill's. And it starts eroding really fast when if all of us would get together, we control our cattle. And so there's a politics of why that, that, that failed. There's a CIS, the Cooperative Interstate, uh, uh, that was put into the uh, 2008 Farm Bill. Is very. It, it's what this bill that uh, the the local uh, bill is is uh, is very similar in our opinion. Like there's there might be little minor differences, but you're really splitting hairs. So it, it pretty much, in my opinion, is going to promote that the 2008 farm bill section on CIS. Um, the uh, but the state plants. Let, let's you know, like I said, we we we're going to need the state plants and the federal plants. And the reason why is this, there's not enough inspectors. <laughs> That's the piece that we're really not talking about is that where are you going to find the inspectors? Whether it is, a, if it's a federal facility, then the federal government has to find the federal inspectors. So let's utilize state resources and state manpower. Let the states do some hiring. And that's like in North Carolina, we're a TA facility, where where that we are federal regulated, but the state hired the inspectors. It might be time to bring that back up and, and re-expand that back out. And that would be the CIS, that would be the uh, the local um, uh, meat spill. Um, so let, let, let's make this really, 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 really simple. The regulations, when we see a meat, pro or when we think meat process and we think Cargill, we think JBS with all this refrigeration and all this stuff, I technically, by, by regulation, I could take a, a foreclosed country convenience store that had a grill in it, and I can turn that into a slaughter and processing facility. And the reason why I say with the grill in is because the meat, uh, meat, the health department guidelines, you got to be able to wash and drain liquid off the floor. So they have floor drainage already in place. They have washable walls, they have washable floors, they have washable ceilings. All that, and you take a foreclosed convenience store, country convenience store, and there's thousands of those, I can turn that into a solar and processing facility. And I can make that in a federal facility or I can make that in a state facility. This is very easily solved. And it, it, you just don't have to have all of this, what the image of what a facility looks like. Um, there are facilities that are being made out of tractor trailer trucks right now. There's facilities that are made out of trailers. I, you just... I'm going to interject mm -hmm. just for the average person who's listening to that, thinking and picturing an old rundown store, understand that like it would have to be up to code. Oh, yeah. Then like you, like your inspector staff is not going to just let you take an old store. Did you see my like, wheels turning? I, I did, like, oh, I did. And, and mine was kind of the same way only because like, yeah, but, but, but the concept is the same. It's almost like you take downtown and you revitalize your downtown communities and like, you know, you invest money into your downtown. So let's, let's take a community icon of sorts that maybe we don't know what to do with it. And then you could repurpose it mm -hmm. for something if you have the right investment. Um, I, I think that's more of a, you know, what he was trying to say, um, you know, 
Yeah, well, you see the creativity here. You know, there's a lot of different solutions, different things that we can do, a lot of exciting things, a lot of good opportunities. These are the things that this task force committee um, are going to be focusing on. So if you want to join us, let us know. We'd love to have some more folks who are really passionate about this issue and, and trying to do what we're doing here. I am going to go to questions now. We're a little bit past the top of the hour, and we've got a few here. Um, we'll just keep going along this theme, it looks like. So we've got Karina Jones from Nebraska who says that Nebraska does not have state inspections. So for her state and for states like it, what are the options if you don't have a state inspection program? The, so that would be, that would rely on a federal uh, or cross the state lines with your, with your cattle. Um, go to Iowa, go to South Dakota. Um, there's somebody somewhere within reasonable distance. We lived in Nebraska for yes. a while, so so we definitely understand that. He actually worked on a feedlot in Nebraska, so yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, some good connections there. And I think Iowa just signed on to the Cooperative Interstate. They did. They did. So that was exciting um, and, and a good move. Yeah, sometimes states can, can sometimes uh, step in. Casey Wild asks, are state regulations more strict than federal regulations? Yes and no. <laughs> and here's the reason why. It, it, again, remember, the laws, don't, the regulations don't say thou shall not. <laughs> There's suggestions. And so it's interpretation of suggestions. There are some things that some states have just focused really hard on due to the fact that of uh, experiences in the past and that uh, they're not, they don't want that to occur again. But all in all, all in all, food safety is food safety. Our goal is, is that nobody gets sick by salmonella, E. coli, listeria, mod uh, shiga toxins. So that's where I say no, you know, it all it's, I, I don't know how I, like, yeah, I mean, and I think it, and again, I, I use analogies only because that, that's what I, I know to do. Um, it's it's just like, you know, you go to, you know, different teachers' classrooms and everybody's going to kind of focus on something differently. Um, it doesn't make somebody better than the other. It's just kind of what their focus is um, and, and kind of builds that culture of, of an environment. Um, and so, again, the, the two things that I can tell you that federal inspections are, are definitely doing, and I think that trickles down to state, is humane mm -hmm. handling. We will not compromise on that, and we absolutely will not compromise on food safety. Now, what that looks like in the whole scope of things, um, you know, kind of varies from, from place to place and, you know, person to person, per se, but, I mean, the ultimate goal is humane handling and food safety all day, all the time. Absolutely. Um, absolutely here. All right, let's 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 see here. Um, Kevin Escobar asks, what advice would you have for anyone trying to get their label approval to sell beef direct? So this might be inside your wheelhouse. <laughs> Perfect, yes, we deal with this. Okay, so Kevin, Say the word beef. That's all you gotta say is the word beef. Say your farm name, say the word beef. Here's where the here's where the difference is. Whatever is on that label is what is regulated. And if you want to say Kevin's best beef ever in the world, the problem is, is then you got to prove that it's the best beef ever in the world. And so then that's when you have to go and have it uh, special claims approved. However, if Kevin just says Kevin's beef, and then on his Facebook, on his Twitter, on his website, he explains how he raised it and how he's saying it's the best beef in the world. Point of sale mm -hmm. material is not regulated. So if we, we want to go into it, we want to just say all this stuff, we deal with other producers and they, they just want to say everything. And I'm like, say it on your website, say it on your social <laughs> media, say it on your, put a banner, put a sign up on your farm, say what you want to say. But say just word beef on your lay on your on your label. The other thing is you could use words within the name of your um, lay, uh, uh, your 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 logo, your tagline. For example, 
We are grass fed, grass finished. I have a beef jerky line. My beef jerky line is called Kiss My Grass Beef Jerky. Kiss My Grass is not regulated. It, but I'm implying what it is if somebody is trying to figure it out. But because of that, I didn't have to go for special claims. And in the North Carolina, we uh, we have like you have to be a certified like be a licensed meat handler in North Carolina, mm -hmm. um, and that that's just um, it's actually a really simple process, um, you know, for North Carolina if if somebody wanted to be independent. So um, you know, again, I wouldn't know state by state what that process is, um, but most states are kind of open to you being able to sell directly and and kind of having that process. Um, and again, it, it comes down to just finding a processor that, that will kind of take the time and educate you on it. Um, it it's kind of our niche of sorts. Um, we enjoy having that conversation with, with producers. Um, you know, we want more meat handlers, licensed meat handlers in the state. Um, and again, because the more we have that are able to sell to their friends and family or sell at farmers markets, that, that, that U.S. beef definitely becomes on more tables and that's what we want. Um, but I think sometimes we think it's complicated. I think sometimes we think it's overwhelming. Um, but quite honestly, there's never been a better time for independent producers to, to become and, and kind of take the leap of faith and, and kind of go out into that. Whether you do farmers markets, whether you put an ad on your face, you know, put a post on your Facebook, whether you you know, put, you know, put a flyer up in your community or something. I don't think selling the product is the issue at this point. Um, I just think it's, it's kind of, you know, just taking that next step. And again, we're happy to help. And I think that's, mm -hmm. again, what we're trying to form with this committee. Yeah. And I uh, know that there that it's about getting more U.S. beef on U.S. plates. Love that bit. If anyone has a take home message tonight, that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Jesse Laney asks, uh, Jesse Laney from looks like Missouri. Uh, I can't tell. I have a question regarding veterinary records on an animal that will go for slaughter. Does each individual animal require a veterinary pass to go to slaughter or can you get a self inspection done? I think it's more of a state, a state by state because like North Carolina, we don't have branding laws. And so what we do in our facility uh, what we do require is um, age documentation um, because of the 30 month rule because of BSC. And so we want you to have a tag. We want you to have your, you know, a copy of the birth records that associates with that tag so that then we can say to the inspector, this animal is under 30 months of age. If not, then they have to do denture checks and they, and they have to make decisions from there. Unfortunately, depending on the breed, rate of maturity, diet, blah, 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 there's thousands of variables. Those teeth can come in a little sooner. And so then we'd have to remove the backbone. You're going to lose uh, product availability along that area. So that's the only thing that we really require in North Carolina. That's what we require. Uh, mm -hmm. But I know that different states, and if you cross the state lines, that could become an issue. Um, you just would check with your, you know, local regulations with that. We also, you have to also verify or confirm that there's been no antibiotics or yes. anything like that that's been given um, and that you had the proper withdrawal time. Um, and so obviously we make our, our producers sign an affidavit just to kind of say that. Um, but again, at any point, the inspectors in a federal facility can say, hey, we want to test that animal. Yeah. And that's at the producers, you know, kind of buyer beware, producer beware, that at any point that can happen um, on our side. Well, there you go. Um, all right, we've got a few more coming in here. So let's go to Jim Luz. Jim Luz, you've got our top fan badge. So thank you for being a top fan of USDA. Um, he asks, what is USDA's inside temperature ranges for processing beef? Does the animal have to be slaughtered and skinned in an enclosed area that is temperature controlled? Actually, this is really funny. 
literally the regulation states that the carcass has to get down to 43 degrees in 24 hours. That's it. So if I have a refrigeration system, and again, I'm going to carry it to the extreme, so please don't take me literal that this is what we do. But if I have a, a refrigeration system I can get from, from body temperature or room temperature down to 43 degrees in one hour, I can, I can leave it hanging out there. So no, the only regulation is, is that the temperature of the carcass has to get down to 43 degrees in 24 hours, period. After that, then you can touch it. And then you can you, you can cut it, you can keep it hanging, you can continue to age it. Everybody, everybody, Cargill, Tyson's, Micro Summit, we all have to play by that one rule. There is the and, and there's actually there's there's you can be in a non-refrigerated room to process. It, uh, it's all about time and temperature with when it comes to regulations. And that allows for the on farm slaughter that you see um, that, I, I, you know, we see the pictures of um, I, that definitely hasn't happened in North Carolina and, no. you know, or any of that here. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the regulations are, are kind of clear in that. Interesting. Well, that must have been a loaded question. Jim, you knew the answer to that. You just <laughs> wanted the rest of us to hear it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, we don't have a question, but we do have a sentiment here that I want to get your reaction to. We've got Andrea Marks, Colorado, great uh, USCA Transportation Committee member who says, the concept of taking cattle marking to a more regional or local approach has the potential of impacting livestock transportation. Uh, large plants will always exist and long haul transporters will never go away, but having cattle on a trailer for shorter periods of time and loading, unloading, and lower stress environments can have a better impact on meat quality for local consumers. Sure That's thoughts? correct. That's correct. <laughs> He's right. He's right. And then also, from a you know environmental standpoint, you're it just there's so this we we centralized our food system way too far in in my opinion, and we need to bring it back out and 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 spread out the risk you know um uh i was thinking about you know in this whole COVID situation people are like we you know, everybody across the country we've never experienced something like this and the reason why we've never experienced this situation with shortages i can't get a burger at wendy's right now in 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 kenley north carolina they don't have beef and it's like the concept just, just blows my mind I'm right i'm 10 miles down the road we we created these channels so the 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 big boys got all this control and but the problem is that what normally has happened like during a hurricane during a hurricane you'll have a, an isolated effect but it's not, it's small compared to everywhere else so that uh, the U.S. can compensate for that. This is this is uh, this is not this is not good. This this exposed a lot of problems with our food system, and and has made it really scary. And then, um, not to digress, but then also what happened? What's happening is is who's been compensating our shortfalls? with the lack of uh, slaughter in, in the United States has been Mexico, South America, and Australia. Two days ago, Brazil, a Brazilian judge uh, shut down a uh, plant in Brazil due to COVID uh, positive. A uh, couple hours ago, Australia shut down JBS, uh, the largest facility due to COVID positive. We have nobody to to compensate for anybody's shortfalls anymore. So let's bring this to a regional system. There, you know, a uh, guy that owns Texas Steakhouse in, uh, he owns the, Texas, Texas Steakhouse here in North Carolina, it's a chain. He has Angus cattle. He takes his calves, he sends them to Kansas. They get slaughtered in Kansas and then the beef comes back to Texas Steakhouse. Why, why do we do all of that? That, that, why don't we just do it in our backyard? If you are a North Carolina franchise, have it North Carolina raised. Let's just stop all this. So I love the, the regional system. It's going to be less stress on the animals, less stress on our drivers, less fuel consumption. Uh, 
we can talk environmental, we can talk about carbon yeah. footprints, we can talk about all of those things and sound, you know, kind of have a dialogue with, with a different audience that, that quite honestly, you know, industrial ag has not been able to have before. Yeah. You know, when we start talking about, you know, true sustainability and true, you know, climate change and all of those conversations, let's make some proactive steps, you know, and and take take control of that conversation and be the offense instead of constantly playing on the defensive side. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And all of these things will kind of help in that conversation. Absolutely. We've got two more questions, it looks like here. Um, one on the COVID situation, so I'm going to keep going on that. Andrea again asks, um, how is your facility assisting in potential USDA depopulation efforts? So we've seen this. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> we don't. That's all months they're, 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 they're uh, you know, that, that's, it's, it's within the major cor companies. There's a Tyson problem, there's a Smithfield problem. You know, and so they're they're handling it internally, or it's a chicken. Um, good friend of mine, seven houses. He was two weeks away from, or one week away from them being emptied out. You know, and getting paid for, and they depopulated the whole place. It's a it, it it's it's it. I don't know. It, but we're not we're not involved. Our depopulation is, is that we're slaughtering the beef, we're processing beef. And, and U.S. folks are consuming our beef. And and I think, you know, again, because we're kind of where we are, Micro Summit doesn't buy and sell animals. Um, but obviously I get phone calls of, you know, things that mm -hmm. are available. Um, and there are a lot of just good people that want to take animals, but maybe could not, you know, have afforded it. Um, and so we've actually been able to place some of those animals that would have been depopulated into other environments and other farms, um, you know, and, and kind of kind of prop them up in other ways. Um, and I know that that was happening in the Midwest. I know that was a great conversation that was happening there. Um, and again, you know, that, that I, again is our ultimate goal, you know, is just how can we help and use the resources that we have. Um, and, and quite honestly, there are people that, you know, like I said, they may can only take two or three, but if we can, you know, take two or three here, or take 20 here, you know, take, you know, 15 here, we can kind of space out that, that problem. And so we have been able to, to kind of place some of those. So that, that's been good for us, but, but we don't depopulate. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. And, and those are some <laughs> of stories that we've been hearing. So that's, that's good to hear that you've been, been able to kind of help, um, help, you know, mediate, remediate those efforts. And, uh, Let's see here, we've got Jesse Laney asks, this one's interesting, where uh, do you recommend getting the best information on the difference in processing a grass-fed versus grain-fed beef? Is there a difference? <laughs> no, it's same slaughter and processing. It's just a different, and it's just a difference in production. There's but it, 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 a, a, a steer is still a steer. It didn't matter if, how it was raised. Um, and so, um, no, there's, there's no difference between the, the slaughter and processing part of it. Yeah. And, and again, I think, you know, um, before COVID, we definitely had a lot more time to spend with our producers in general and just kind of have some dialogue and kind of help them, you know, in their marketing side of things. Um, post COVID, we've been so busy in the office that, you know, that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, but from a but he's right from a processing side the rule book is still the same um that's not going to change um just making sure you know that you kind of surround yourself with people that that can kind of help educate you um and kind of give you the answers to kind of address that question um a lot of times we're put in environments as speakers where, you know, people want to kind of play that grass fed, grain fed conversation against, you know, with us, um, especially with 
I, I feel like I, I get that a lot. Um, whenever I sit on panels, it's always, well, here's a grain fed farmer and you're grass fed and they kind of want us to go at each other. Um, and I, I don't think that that's the conversation anymore. Um, I, I think we're kind of moving past that. I think consumer demand is, is what's driving a lot of things. I think economics is what's driving things. Um, and so, you know, kind of our individual opinions about anything you know, there, there's there's room at the table, especially now for everybody. I um, mean, it's just a matter of, you know, different is different. It's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. And like, let's celebrate those differences and, and finding people that, that can kind of help you celebrate what makes your product different. We'll do one more question, I think, and then we'll, we'll close it out here. We're getting to the top of the hour, which for East Coast time, like I said, it's pretty late. So uh, That's going say you can tell the farm, the sun's gone down here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so Jim Luz uh, asks again, uh, custom slaughter plants are booked here in Texas until summer of 2021. What is the outlook in North Carolina like? Uh, we're working on February the 1st right now, 2021. Um, it's, you know, but the, 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 all of that's going to be, all that could be fixed with labor and all that could be fixed when labor, when we start removing animals from, from the system and we, and we divert the animals over to the independent processors, the labor force is going to move from the Cargills and the, and the, and the IBPs and Tysons, they will then move into these smaller facilities. Um, we're actually enacting a plan in the next couple of weeks that will actually shorten our February 1st down up and then we'll be booked into the middle of July. Um, and so the infrastructure, and that's the piece, the infrastructure is in place right now. We, the buildings are there, the refrigeration is there, the, the piece that, that has moved away was the labor piece, but the labor piece went where the animals were going. Let's the, when there will be a there will be a short break, you know, there'll be a there'll be a struggle there for a little while. But when somebody's hours keep getting cut because the animals aren't there, they're going to show up looking for work in their skill set. The other thing that's getting really interesting is we have a lot of employees from other facilities coming to us because they want out of those facilities because of the COVID going across. And so they, 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 they need to work. They got to work. We know how to do this. Let us come mm -hmm. in. And we're, we're not, we've taken the stance that we need to make, we haven't brought it into our facility. We've done a good job. Our employees, none of them have been tested. None of them, we don't have that problem in our facility. We have responsible, educated employees. Mm -hmm. And so, but um, so we're trying to figure out how we can integrate them, that other labor in. Once the plant gets labor, all of these times will shorten up. But it's been 20 years. This has been a 20-year erosion that's not going to be fixed overnight, unfortunately. Well, I was going to ask for your one key takeaway, but I think that might be it. It's not going to be fixed overnight. This is going to be a real uphill battle. We've got a lot of challenges to overcome. We've got a lot of powerful players working against us. Um, being on Capitol Hill, we see that all the time. The, the lobbying power of the big four meat packers is absolutely incredible. Um, and so I think one of the strengths that we have is numbers. There's a lot more of us compared to them. Um, and, you know, just from the folks that are tuning in tonight, that's part of the process It's you know, getting educated on these topics so you can go speak um, intelligently to your members of Congress on these issues and uh, getting involved, getting involved in this uh, independent processing task force. We need more folks uh, joining up. We need, uh, we need more people that are, you know, passionate about these issues and wanna, wanna put more American beef on American plates. And so, um, I might have taken your one key takeaway there, but uh, what do you want folks to go home with tonight? Um, the, the bottom line is, is that the cattlemen control the situation. We are not beholden. Uh, we're not beholden to the 
the big five, the big four. We're not, we, we don't have to do this. And it, it, yes, it's going to take a little extra work. It's going to take a little extra effort. A friend of mine is a marketing specialist for a sweet potato company. Sweet potato company was the first one to ever hire a marketing specialist. And because they want to create a branded program, you know, I've had to learn how to market 30 years. But if I, if I didn't, if I wanted to stick with just, I'm going to breed cows and raise calves, then I would have hired somebody. Like we're going to have to adjust who our workforce is, but the cattlemen are in control. People are going to eat beef. There are places to get these animals harvested and processed, but we can't just keep, go back to, we can't, we can't, there's no way we can go back to just delivering animals to Cargill. We've got to, we got to go ahead and start working on those changes now. Amy, any yeah. final thoughts from your end? No, I mean, I, I obviously, I mean, I agree with everything you said. And, and, you know, again, you know, I teach my children, you know, people will, people will treat you, you know, how you expect them to. So like, you have to sometimes, you know, earn respect, but sometimes it's okay to demand respect too. And like, at this point in this conversation, where we are now with the prices that are getting the attention that that the whole industry has gotten it's okay to walk a little taller you know kind of demand a little bit more like this is okay um and you know patrick says all the time you know nobody else is going to care for your family and care for your farm unless you do and like that's what we want you know our farm's been in my family for over a hundred years and you know that's what we fight for every day and that's what we we're fighting for you know, our cattlemen, our U.S. cattlemen for the same thing, you know, but unfortunately when you fight alone, that's, that's a hard battle. So let's link arms together and, and do this, mm -hmm. transform it. Well, I couldn't have said it again, so I think we're going to end on that. Thank you all for joining us for another Facts Only Friday. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>